Well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Gavin, but I guess I'd say to you what Gerald Ford said to New York City in 1975. Drop dead. Yes. The following podcast contains... Do you have to use so many cuss words? Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you thought you could fix a staggering long-term financial crisis with a button, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is episode number 348, When Inflation Comes Along, You Must Whip It edition of the show, where we talk about financial things that we don't really understand, but that's okay because no one really does. Stay tuned. Hey, the What the Hell Will You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Fast Eddie's Financial Advisors. You got money problems? We can help. So, for example, you put large bills on the big game and your team crept out. Now you need some fast cash to get you out of a bind. You need Fast Eddie's Financial Advisors. We offer fast, easy money, no credit checks, and accept all kinds of collateral. Use his house, use his car, use his new kneecaps. If you value it, Fast Eddie will hold it in collateral for your financial bailout. Fast Eddie's financial advisors won't bog you down with a lot of forms of gobbledygook. We give you cash, and in return, you pay us back in easy installments. Hell, you keep up the VIG. I mean interest. You don't got to worry about the primary. Fast Eddie's financial advisors, we pay you, and you will definitely pay us back. And now from the White House, the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. In the past, I have given fireside chats, and tonight, because it is spring, I have chosen to give a plantside chat. I love the spring. Everything grows, plants, trees, little baby animals. But some things don't, some things grow that, that we don't want to grow, like inflation. Inflation is our nation's number one problem. Yet most people don't even understand it. But it's really quite simple. Inflation is caused by too many dollars chasing too few goods. Now, the easiest way to get money out of circulation is to maintain high unemployment so people won't have jobs or money to spend. This is a program my administration has actively pursued. Yet inflation continues to rise. And so tonight, I'm proposing a new program, one which will call on all Americans to sacrifice once again, but which will, however, have immediate effect. I'm asking each and every American to take 8% of your money and burn it. One of the really sucky things about unexpectedly living as long as I have is watching the world go into reruns. Let's have any rerun. What up, Rod? <laughs> you see, kids, long before streaming, television had what we used to call seasons. It usually ran from September through May, where new episodes would come on each week instead of all at once. I mean, doesn't that sound archaic? It had its charms. But the problem was, between the end of May and the end of September each year, the previous season's show would repeat while new episodes were being made. Meaning you saw the same shit you just saw all over again until the new season started. And as I grind painfully into my 50s, that's what seems to be happening with the world. Sure, new stuff is happening, but even the new stuff is kind of like the old stuff with just a new finish. I mean, this pandemic thing is nothing new. We've had lots of pandemics through history. Dumber than this one. Eh, That's hard to say. I mean, during the Black Death, they would examine your piss to see what was wrong with you. And during this one, people are drinking their piss because they think it will cure them. Because people are getting stupider. Definitely. And what's worse, history's reruns are coming closer and closer together as we all careen down the shit-encrusted chute toward oblivion, which I gotta say, can't happen soon enough for me. Finally, something we can agree on. Even worse, along with coming faster and being dumber, all the reruns are just not as exciting as the stuff that happened in history. I mean, yeah, I guess that's actually a good thing because no one, with the exception of the GOP base, wants the Black Death Part 2 electric boobaloo. But if you have a faint, nodding acquaintance with history... Oh, hey, I know that guy. 
or you're like me and had to eat pancakes three meals a day because that's all your family could afford to buy at the grocery store for a couple of years, you know that whatever's happening now is nowhere near as shitty as the thing that came before it. So it's hard for me to get too worked up about whatever it is going on now. I listen to people complain and I'm all like, things can get much worse for you. Because I lived through a time when it was worse. Our disaster du jour is our old friend. Inflation is out of control. I know you've all heard that if you're reading the news or the Facebook post of your one or two right-leaning friends that you have remaining after the past few years that everyone is worried about inflation. Do you even know what the current inflation rate is as of this recording in January of 2022? I doubt it. Let me inform you. 7%. Meaning that prices of goods and services have increased 7% since December of 2020. That is bad. Inflation has been at a steady 2% for a long time. Indeed, for as long as a lot of people have been alive. But some of us, the olds, can remember a time that we would have dreamed for 7% inflation because back in the 1970s, it was double that. Meaning prices rose 12 to 14% every year oh that sounds bad it was and what was worse usually when inflation goes up you know your your paycheck goes up as well but in the 1970s there was also really high unemployment so our benevolent corporate masters didn't need to raise our wages because everyone was competing for what few jobs there were in short the economy was well and truly fucked and no one had a fucking clue what to do about it this week, we'll talk about real inflation and all the bad ways the government tried to do something about it and failed. Before we can begin, we need to talk about what inflation is and what causes it. Evil spirits, maybe? Yeah, sure, that's as good an explanation as any. However, according to Business Insider, quote, Inflation is the increase of the price of goods and services over time. Inflation causes your buying power to erode, meaning that the same dollar today buys less in the future. The simple story is too much money chasing too few goods and services, says Dean Baker, senior economist at the Center for Economic Policy and Research, unquote. It then goes on to explain the causes of inflation. The first is demand, meaning that the demand for things exceeds their supply, causing prices to rise like when a snowstorm comes and everyone freaks out and rushes to the grocery store for milk and bread and the grocery store raises prices because the demand for milk and bread goes up. Don't let this price gouging charlatan take you for a ride. Okay, that was actually an example of textbook price gouging, but when it happens over a long period of time, or a month or more, price gouging becomes demand. Next is cost push meaning that the cost of things go up because materials and labor make it cost more to produce. Next is an increased money supply, meaning the government has pumped out a lot of money in a very short period of time, causing the prices to shoot up in response. A lot of people blame all the stimulus that helped people, you know, survive the pandemic for this current bump in prices that we're experiencing now. Next is currency devaluation, meaning the exchange rate for a currency suddenly goes down, making it cheaper to buy shit from the country devaluing the currency and more expenses to buy it with your own currency. Then comes rising wages. When demand for higher wages happens, then prices go up because, well, prices go up because the corporations are... You are a bunch of fucking assholes. You see, if they give us more money in our paycheck then they're gonna raise prices to get as much of that money back as possible. And finally, a country's financial policies like raising taxes on certain items or imports can also cause prices to spike. Now, you might have noticed sort of a common theme in all of these causes of inflation that kind of correlated to when we, you know, the working people of the world, have more money and power. So the system adjusts to take the money and power away from us because the system, and I want to be very clear on this, is designed to fuck you over as much as possible so the rich get to keep all the goddamn money. Yes, that sums it up, yes. But what happened in the 1970s was a little different. You see, what had happened was is the United States had experienced decades of growth to the point that even poor people had some money, and then... Shit hit the fan. <laughs> exactly. And that shit sprayed all over the country for an entire decade. What happened, you ask? Well, for a change, it wasn't Ronald Reagan, but someone 
almost as bad. Nixon? Nixon. All right. What happened is incredibly complex, and I only barely understand it, and I spent the last week reading about it. So what I'm about to tell you is about the third grade level of economic policy mixed with a heavy dose of late life socialism and a lot of cursing. You know, the usual. From what I can tell, it began with Bretton Woods. Oh man, I'm sorry for what I gotta do now because you're probably like me and when you're in the 11th grade, you skipped history class to go out and get high, and now I have to explain to you what Bretton Woods was. Bretton Woods was a policy conference that happened right after World War II. The Western Allies met to divide up the world economically rather than physically, figuring that it would be much easier to keep a stranglehold on the world with money than it was with guns. And they were not wrong. One of the policies that came out of Bretton Woods was that the currency exchange rates for most of the world would be fixed to the U.S. dollar, and that would be linked to the price of gold. And this all means, uh, what? It means that the amount of U.S. dollars held by other nations had to amount to the amount of gold we had in Fort Knox or wherever it is they really kept the gold in alien bodies. And by 1971... There was just one tiny little problem with this is that all the amount of money that the other countries now held far exceeded the amount of gold that the United States had. So Dick Nixon decided, we're not gonna do this anymore. And remove the last vestiges of the gold standard. This meant that money was now worth whatever people thought it was worth. I mean, it was always that way, but without gold, all of a sudden people realized that... Please, that's just a piece of paper. And the next thing that happened was is Dick implemented a series of wage and price controls that had the effect of freezing wages, but not so much the prices. Because with the prices frozen, the people that made things like food just stopped making as much of it, and the prices skyrocketed anyway. And then there was Maud. And then there's Maud. And then there's And then there's more. And then there's more. That'll compromise and enterprise and anything but tranquilize and right on on. On. Except, you know, it wasn't B. Arthur. It was the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, consisting largely of Arabian nations who suddenly figured out that they had the world by the balls and promptly started to squeeze them. The oil crises are shows in and of themselves, but let's suffice to say that OPEC had the oil, we needed the oil, and they were going to make us pay for it. And finally, in the coup de grace that set off runaway inflation, the Federal Reserve failed to raise interest rates early on, which is usually how you tamp down inflation with just small increases. But what they did was nothing. This, along with all the other pre-existing conditions, caused inflation to shit the bed harder than an anti-vaxxer coughing his lungs out in an overcrowded ICU. There you have all the major causes of inflation rolled into one decade. Spikes of demand, high wages from previous economy, some currency devaluation, and a whole bunch of economic policies that all collided into one big superstorm of financial instability that was the 1970s. And who did we have to fight this fiscal meltdown? A man no one elected, and few had even heard of, until... He became the president. And a young man named Gerald Ford. Yeah. Gerald Ford wasn't a bad guy. I mean, yeah, he was a Republican, but that meant something a little different back then. But all in all, Jerry didn't do anything to deserve what happened to him. And what happened to him was he inherited the White House under horrible circumstances after being appointed vice president when the sitting vice president was caught doing some criminal shit almost as bad as a sitting president. He had a long... Not exactly distinguished, but not embarrassing career in the House of Representatives. That's Gerald Ford, not Dick Nixon. Rising to the House Minority Leader, the most powerful Republican, in a House of Representatives that had long been held by the Democrats and was definitely being held by the Democrats after Dick Nixon. Jerry wasn't an exciting guy and actually preferred being on the sidelines. He had refused to run for the Senate or for the governorship of his native Michigan. And what was worse is Jerry wasn't considered to be actually smart lyndon johnson said of him quote jerry ford is so dumb he can't fart and chew gum at the same time unquote what he was 
was a dependable, rock-solid party man and knew the workings of Congress. So when Spiro Agnew resided one step ahead of federal charges, the GOP forced him on Nixon as a vice president because he had no higher ambitions. They figured he would serve out his term with Nixon and then step aside for the preferred candidate of the GOP, none other than Ronald Wilson Reagan. Because Jerry Ford was... Oh, him? He's nobody. He was just Jerry. And then just Jerry became Gerald R. Ford, 38th president of the United States of America. And he got a country in shambles and an economy in free fall and no fucking clue what to do about any of it. Well, shit. When Ford took office, the annual inflation rate was 12%. Unemployment was at 8%. Gas prices were spiking. The entire country was reeling from the end of the Vietnam War, Watergate, and the rise of disco. Disco stew likes disco music. America needed a plan to get out of this mess, and what we got was a button. Not some kind of magic button that we could just push and everything would be better, but the kind of buttons that the wait staff at shitty fucking theme restaurants pin on their apron for their 15 pieces of flair. The kind of buttons that kids in the 1980s would pin on our denim jackets to let the world know that we hated Mondays and how much we loved Def Leppard. President Ford unveiled his fix for inflation in a speech to Congress in October of 1975. During the meetings on inflation, I listened carefully to many valuable suggestions. Since the summit, I have evaluated literally hundreds of ideas, day and night. My conclusions are very simply stated. There is only one point on which all advisors have agreed. We must whip inflation right now. Hundreds of ideas. Dozens of advisors, presumably the best economic minds in the country. And this is the best that you could come up with? This is your best. Maybe you ought to keep it to yourself. It would be one thing if this was just a catch-all slogan that summed up the actual plan, but uh, it became rapidly clear that the slogan was the plan. We are so fucked. Quoting from the Washington Post, quote, Ford slapped on a button as he continued. The symbol of this new mobilization, he said, is the button which I am wearing on my lapel. It bears the single word, win. Now I will call upon every American to join this massive mobilization and to stick with it until we do win as a nation. The president and the first lady, Betty Ford, publicly signed a pledge to personally fight inflation. I pledge to my fellow citizens that I will buy, when possible, only those products and services priced at or below present levels, the president declared. He said the pledge applied especially to his wife, who spends all the money. Mrs. Ford joked, I signed in blood, unquote. Still, Americans do love a slogan, and as the post continues, quote, when buttons began popping up all over the country. When Ford landed in Los Angeles, Governor Reagan of California was waiting at the airport sporting his win button. King Supers, the supermarkets in Denver, plastered their windows with win posters and the slogan, King Supers leads the fight to whip inflation now. Songwriter Meredith Wilson of the Music Man fame wrote a win song. Who needs inflation? Not this nation. By mid-November, orders for win buttons passed the 50 million mark. It was the best selling button since 1971 when more than 50 million smiley face buttons were sold. Unquote. Yeah, buttons were a thing back then. I can't explain it, but we all we all just really liked our buttons. Also, uh, I did try to find audio of Meredith Wilson's song. It appears to be lost to the internet, but the line, who needs inflation, not this nation, appears to be pretty much the entire song. So, you know, maybe it's better loss to digital history. The idea behind whip inflation now, if it can be called an idea, was that regular, ordinary Americans could whip inflation by promising to save money and only buy goods and services at current prices are lower. Now, 
I can hear some of you asking, but what if the prices continue to go up? What should they do then? Good question. And the answer was... There was no answer. Yeah, that's right. They sort of left that part out of the program. Sure, I can see maybe people didn't need to buy a second pet rock or maybe didn't need that new album by Captain and Tennille. But you're going to need things like food or gasoline if you could find it. You know, the little things that make life, you know, possible. And those prices, <laughs> those prices on the things that you actually need to survive, well, they kept going up. And it didn't take long for people to notice that wearing a wind button wasn't a panacea for inflation. Quote it again from the Post, quote, New York Times humor columnist Russell Baker wrote that he wore his wind button to the butcher shop and focused his powerful message on the hamburger. The price purred and rose immediately. This one doesn't work. Give me another, comedian Bob Hope, a Ford friend, quipped. President Ford went on television to tell us all how we can whip inflation, and within half an hour, the price of whips went up 50%. In November, reporters spotted what looked like a distress signal from the White House press secretary, Ron Nesson, who inadvertently wore his button upside down. It spelled NIM. Nesson said it stood for no immediate miracles. And by December, use of the wind buttons was falling like leaves from the trees. When Beatle George Harrison visited the White House, Ford wanted to give him a wind button, but he couldn't find one, Reuters reported, unquote. Economist Alan Greenspan, that's probably a name you're familiar with, wrote in his book, The Age of Turbulence, about his experience with button economics, saying, quote, I agreed with the president's priorities. But I was horrified to learn how his White House staff planned to tackle the issue. The speechwriters had ordered up millions of whip inflation now buttons, samples of which they handed out to those of us in the room. It was surreal. I was the only economist present, and I said to myself, this is unbelievable stupidity. What am I doing here? Unquote. The WIN program, if it could be called a program rather than a really fucking dumb thing in lieu of a program, was more or less dead by the following spring. Prices continued to go up. The economy was sliding hard into recession and unemployment rose even more. A columnist in the New York Daily News quipped, quote, A new poll shows that 55% of the country can't afford WIN buttons, unquote. Look, Gerald Ford wasn't as inept as LBJ and this new show on television called Saturday Night Live made him out to be. It was my understanding that there would be no math. He was handed a shit sandwich and all he could do with it was trim off the crust, slice it into little triangles and put an olive on a toothpick through the middle of it and serve it to America. He didn't ask to be president. He didn't really want to be president, which ironically made him one of the few people in the universe that should actually be president. The problems were just too big. They were caused by so many different issues occurring simultaneously that anyone in the White House, even fucking FDR, wouldn't be do able to do much to fix them easily and quickly. But that's what the people wanted. But still... A button and a slogan is one of the most tragic comic idea that has ever come out of the White House, and that sums up the brief and painful Ford administration in a nutshell. Inflation continued through the entire decade. As Jimmy Carter inherited the shit, shit, shit sandwich, he too struggled to try to get it under control, along with a second and worse OPEC crisis, and just a sense of what came to be called national malaise. And we're going to talk about all that in about two weeks when I tell you the tale of a very good president who no one thinks was very good at all, Jimmy Carter. But first, we got to talk about the gas crisis that was so important to all of this, and that's coming next week. But for now, I got to tell you about what finally fixed inflation. Sound, if draconian, fiscal policy. Mm, that sounds a little boring. Trust me, it is, so I'm going to keep it short. Late 1979, Jimmy Carter appointed this cat to the Federal Reserve Chair by the name of Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker is a name that economists moan in their sex dreams, but no one else knows anything about. Volcker knew that the system was fucked, and to fix it, basically what needed to be done was... By unplugging it and plugging it back in. 
And when you took the position, the inflation rate was a whopping 14.8% and showed no signs of dropping. So Volcker did what everyone knew had to be done, but no one wanted to do because the fallout was going to be bad. Real, real bad. And to his never-ending credit, Jimmy Carter looked Paul Volcker right in the eye and said, do it. And Volcker jacked up the interest rates to over 20%. The economy freaked the fuck out and it kicked off another recession, a bad one. Unemployment spiked to 10% and it was one of the reasons Ronald Reagan got elected. But you know what? Raising the interest rates worked. By 1983, inflation fell below 3% and stayed that way for almost 40 years until our current little bump. Volcker served two terms as Fed chair and is widely credited along with fucking Ronald Reagan for saving the economy, when in reality it was Jimmy Carter who had the guts to risk losing by turning the guy loose to do what needed to be done, but that as they say, is a story for another day. So, you're asking yourself, should I be worried about inflation today? returning back to the level of the 1970s. No. Calm down, have some dip. Again, I'm not an economist. Uh, Did not even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, but uh, I did just research this entire episode about inflation, and I can say with the confidence of the barely informed... How very American of you. That the world and the economy is in a vastly different place than it was in the 1970s. Our current inflation is a symptom of COVID as much as the dry hacking cough and the loss of taste and smell. And like COVID, we have an inoculation that can keep the symptoms under control. We can raise interest rates, which is what we're doing. Fortunately for us, we have another president who's probably going to be a one-termer and willing to take the short-term hit to keep the economy from going on a ventilator like an anti-vax rock star in an overcrowded ICU. I guess now we know what Meatloaf wouldn't do for his loved ones. Get the fucking vaccine. It's too soon. It's too soon. Or, you know, like everything else in the world, we could fuck around and find out that the 1970s are back in a big way. No matter what happens, though, disco is definitely not coming back because, baby, it never went away. WZAZ in Chicago, where disco lives forever. (laughs) That is it for our show this week. This is not part one of something, but merely the first part of an interconnected web of episodes about the 1970s that I've had in the hopper for a minute and wanted to do for a long time. Next week, I'm going to tell you about the gas crisis, which is part of the bigger tale of the 1970s, and then I will conclude with why Jimmy Carter was never a bad president, even if I always will love Billy Carter more. Speaking of disappointments like Billy Carter, rate and review this show wherever you get your pods. It helps others find it and experience that same sense of disappointment that you felt the first time you listened, but somehow got over and continue to listen. Support the show at patreon.com slash what the hell podcast. Your donation help keep inflationary pressures in check by contributing to the cost of whiskey for a podcast host. Do all the things Jeremy's about to tell you in the closer because he loves you and wants you to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be, just like the captain and Tennille. And so for me, Dave, crack that whip and give the pass to slip Bledsoe, producer, step on a crack, break your mama's back. Oh, Oh, that's horrible. Why would anyone say something like that? Gavin and all the fictional wearers of Devo hats on this show. We want to say that when inflation comes along, you must whip it with sound fiscal policy, not silly buttons and dumb slogans on them. And we'll see you all next week. What the Hell Were You Thinking stars Dave Bledsoe and features Gavin St. James and several fictional minions. The show is produced by Kimberly Steele and a part of the Seltzer Kings Podcast Network. You can find more information on the show on their website, whatthehellpodcast.com, or on Twitter at thehell underscore podcast, or on Facebook as What the Hell Podcast. Thanks for listening. 
I have no ending for this, so I take a small bow. Got a cigarette, Nelson? Uh, Linda. Your husband and the others are alive, but unconscious. Just like Gerald Ford. <laughs>